All right, so this is section 2.4, Math 146, video number two. Unfortunately, I could not find a nice example that has both a slant asymptote and a hole in it. So we're going to have to do kind of two separate ones. Uh, we'll try and make the one with the hole in it relatively quick. Um, but for now, let's focus on one that actually has a slant asymptote and how to do it. So this will be example two. And f of x here is going to equal x squared plus x minus 12 over x plus 2. All right, so we have to find all the same things. Now, in this case, um, the entire numerator and denominator were not in factored form. So if possible, you should write them in factored form. It makes things a lot easier. So let's go ahead and factor that numerator since the denominator doesn't have anything to factor. So it looks like on top we're going to have uh, x. x to get that positive 1, we're going to have to have a 4 and a 3. 4 has to be the plus, 3 has to be the minus. So now that's in factored form. So that'll help us to find some of our information. Okay, let's talk about the asymptotes first. So the vertical asymptote is whatever makes the denominator zero. In this case, that would be x equals negative two, as long as that doesn't also make the numerator zero. And obviously I do not have another x plus two on top, so we're good there. So x equals negative two is your vertical asymptote. Let's talk about the horizontal asymptotes. Uh, in this case, the degree of the numerator happens to be larger than the degree of the denominator, so we will not have any horizontal asymptotes. Again, if you think about it, as x gets really big in both directions, um, the fraction itself is just going to get bigger and bigger because the numerator will be bigger than the denominator, so it's not going to approach any specific y value, so we would have none. <clears throat> We'd have to check to see whether we have any holes. There aren't any holes because nothing makes both the numerator and denominator zero. Again, I said that that would be the case in this one. But we do have a slant or oblique asymptote. And the reason I know that is because the degree of the numerator is exactly one higher than the degree of the denominator. Had that highest power in the top been x cubed and the denominator was still x plus two, you would actually not have a horizontal or a slant asymptote, but because it's exactly one higher, we do. And here's how you find the slant asymptote. This is why what we did a couple of sections ago is important. We are going to have to do long division of polynomials. Or technically you could do, um, you could do synthetic as well. I'm going to show long division in this case, but you can do whatever works the best. So now let's think about this real quick. If I'm taking something which is one degree higher in the numerator than it is in the denominator, when I divide a polynomial of degree two by a polynomial of degree one, it should leave you with a polynomial of degree one, which means it is a linear equation. And that's ultimately why this works. It would work with no matter what um, degrees you have. If you have a degree of five on top, if you have a degree of four on the bottom and you divide them, you should end up with a degree of one, which is a linear equation. Again, remember that all these asymptotes are lines. So that's why this works. So let's do a real quick long division. And again, you could do synthetic. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> so what do I multiply times x to get x squared? Well, of course, that's x. So then we'll distribute that and subtract. x squareds go away. x minus 2x is minus x. Bring down the minus 12. And then what do I multiply times x to give me that negative x? Well, that would be negative 1. And technically, the rest of this doesn't matter. I'm going to finish it off. But the remainder here that you get actually doesn't matter as far as your slant asymptote. So technically, we would uh, negative x's go away. Negative 12 minus a minus 2 is plus 2. So that would give me negative 10 as a remainder. Has uses for other things, but not in this case. So your slant asymptote is actually this piece right here. It's the equation y equals x minus 1. So the slant asymptote is y equals x minus 1. 
All right, so we have all of our asymptotes. When we go to graph those, that'll be, um, that'll be one of the first things that we do. We are also going to need to find the X and Y intercepts. So the X intercept is whatever makes the numerator zero, as long as it doesn't also make the denominator zero, which we know we don't have because that would have created a hole. So the numerator is going to be made zero by X equals negative four. And since it's an ordered pair, it's a point, it's an intercept, it's negative four, zero, and positive three. So three, zero. Again, these are ordered pairs. You need to write them as ordered pairs. The y-intercept is simply whatever you get when you plug zero in for x. And you can do that from the factored form or the original form. I think doing it from the original form is probably easier because if you plug zero in for x, all of these are going to be zero, which just leaves you with negative 12 over 2, which is negative 6. So the y-intercept is going to be 0, negative 6. <clears throat> and then we can talk about domain and range. Once again, I'll do the domain part. The domain, you just pretty much have to eliminate whatever made that denominator 0, which in this case was just negative 2. So the domain is all x values from negative infinity up to negative 2 in union with negative 2 off to infinity because everything else other than negative 2 works. That's your domain. And then the range will come back to, especially once we see the graph, but I am pretty sure this is also going to be a negative infinity to infinity, but we'll double check that in a second. All right, let's graph this. Let's see how this works. So let's graph the vertical asymptote of x equals negative 2 first. So 1, 2. So right there, boy, that was awful. I completely missed, probably because my original XY graph is not the best there. I did not do the best vertical line for my Y axis. Um, but there's X equals negative two. We don't have any horizontals or holes, but we do have the slant asymptote X minus one. So that is the equation Y equals X minus one. That means it has a slope of one and a Y intercept of one. So it's going to hit the y-axis at negative 1, and then have a slope of 1, which means it also hits the x-axis at 1, and continues in that fashion. So that's going to be a very interesting looking graph here. <clears throat> so again, you have to check the two different parts of your domain now. Oh, let's, I'm sorry, let's graph our intercepts. I almost forgot that part. Uh, we'll put those in green since I wrote them in green. So negative 4, 0, and 3, 0. So negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 0 is going to be someplace out there. <clears throat> 3, 0 is going to be, let's see, that would be 1 at the x-axis where it intercepts. So 3, 0 is someplace out there. <clears throat> and then I also have a y-intercept of 0, negative 6, which is going to be way down here. I probably did not do that justice, but it's going to be, pretty far down on the y-axis. All right, so we've actually answered most of the questions that we need in this case because you basically have to check, again, you have to check the two intervals in this case of your domain. You have to see what the graph is doing from negative infinity to negative two or up to that first vertical asymptote. And since we already have a point which is above the slant asymptote, and that point is the point negative four zero, this function doesn't have an awful lot of choice here. As it starts to go further and further or closer and closer to the right, it's going to approach the vertical asymptote and it can't go down because if it does, it's actually gonna have to cross through the x-axis. So the only possibilities this has is to go up here and then as it goes, this is, I did not do a very good job with this graph. Extend that horizontal, I mean the slant asymptote out much further. As it goes further and further to the left, it's going to start to go down, going to approach that um, slant asymptote. That should have been much smoother looking going through there. Something like that. And then if you look off to the right, it should kind of hopefully make sense. You can kind of see how that those things are going to connect. 
And as it goes closer and closer to the vertical asymptote, it's going to start to go down and ride the vertical asymptote. Let me extend that. And then as it goes towards the right, it's going to go through its other intercept, its x-intercept, and then start to ride along the slant asymptote. Yeah, my sketch is not the best, but that's kind of the way this graph is supposed to look. Can't have anything in those other spaces because if you do, it would no longer be a function. And it definitely looks like all possible y values are going to be taken on here. So your range is going to go from negative infinity to infinity. All right, let's try and do one real quick example of something that has a hole in it and how you might sketch that. This will be example number three. So I'm kind of making this one up off the top of my head, but I know this will work at least for what we're trying to do. So let's say that we've got x plus 2 over x squared minus 4. So again, we should put that into factored form. The numerator is fine. But the denominator is the difference of squares, so that should be x plus 2 and x minus 2. All right, so let's start off like we always have. Let's start off with the vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes are what makes the denominator zero as long as it doesn't make the numerator zero. So x equals two will make the numerator, excuse me, the denominator zero. x equals minus two would make the denominator zero, but it also makes the numerator zero. So that in itself, we cannot call a vertical asymptote. That's actually gonna create our hole. So I'm gonna skip a line here and actually write that down. And the hole is gonna occur when x equals negative two. But there is a y value associated with that. So here's how you find that y value. Because right now, if you plug in negative two, you're gonna get zero on top and bottom and that just doesn't exist, which is why it's a hole in the graph. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna go ahead and simplify this fraction as if we were gonna cancel out the x plus twos. Well, that would leave you with one over x minus 2. Now granted, 1 over x minus 2 is not the actual function, but it's the simplified version if we were to eliminate the whole. So now if you plug negative 2 into x for that, you would get 1 over negative 2 minus 2, which is 1 over negative 4. So negative, oops, let's go back to red. Negative 1 fourth is the y value where that whole exists or the function itself doesn't exist, depending on how you want to look at it. We'll sketch that and then you'll see it. Horizontal asymptote. So the denominator's degree is higher than the numerator's degree, which means that this one is going to approach y equals zero. Again, that is always the case when the denominator's degree is higher. <clears throat> All right, and since we have a horizontal asymptote, we cannot possibly have a slant, so there are none. Okay, let's find the x and y intercepts. X intercept is what makes the numerator zero as long as it doesn't make the denominator zero. Well, in this case, there are no x intercepts because negative two makes the numerator zero, but it also makes the denominator zero, hence the whole. So we have no x intercepts. This thing never touches the x axis. The y intercept is what you get when you plug in zero for x. And if you plug in zero for x on both the numerator and the denominator, you're gonna get two over negative four, which is negative one half. So it'll be at the point zero, negative one half. That's your y-intercept. Domain, we do have to eliminate um, whatever values make the denominator zero, regardless of whether it's a whole or an asymptote, doesn't matter. So the domain, we have to eliminate positive and negative two. So the domain will be from negative infinity to negative two, and then from negative two to positive two, and then from two off to infinity. So we're gonna have three different sections of things to check, and then we'll talk about the range when we get done with the graph. So let's go ahead and sketch what this thing would look like. So we have a vertical asymptote at x equals two. We'll put that out here, x equals two. 
<clears throat> we are going to have a horizontal asymptote, which is the um, x-axis or y equals zero. We do have a hole. We'll have to take care of the hole in a second, but the hole would be at the point negative two, negative one fourth. As a matter of fact, we can do that now. So if we go to negative two, negative one fourth, which would be approximately right there. Well, what I just did was I actually created a point on the graph. Well, that's not what we want. We don't want there to be a point at all. So in order to indicate that there's no point there, but it's still going to be like your function is going to go through that section, what you're going to do instead of having that filled in dot is we're going to create an open circle. And it's exaggerated. There's no way that the hole is that big, but it's exaggerated so that we can see that that's where the hole is. So that's going to indicate our hole in the graph. Um, let's see, we do not have any x-intercepts, but we do have a y-intercept at 0, negative 1 half. Well, if that's at one, negative 1 fourth, then 0, negative 1 half is going to be a little bit further down. Yeah, not drawn very well to scale here at all, but that would be like our 0, negative 1 half. <clears throat> Since this has no x-intercepts, you can see how this is going to work, that if I were to go from my y-intercept towards the vertical asymptote of x equals 2, it's got to go down. Okay, there's no way for it to go up because if it went up, it would have to cross to the x-axis. We don't have any x-intercepts. As we go further and further off to the left, we're going to have to approach that horizontal asymptote, but we're going to actually go through the hole. Basically, you hit this hole here, and then you keep on going after the hole, and it looks something like that. So that's kind of what a hole in the graph looks like. And then if you were to go um, to the right-hand side of x equals, uh, x equals 2, now you have to figure out, is this graph going to be below the x-axis or above it? Because you know it can't go through it since there's no x-intercepts. So you're simply going to take a value like 3 and plug it in. If I plug a 3 in here, that's going to be positive. Here it's positive. Here it's positive. So if I plug in 3, it's going to be some value up here, which is positive. We know as it goes off to the right, it's going to approach the horizontal. As it comes to the left, it will approach the vertical, and it has to go up because it can't go through the x-axis. So the range in this case, well, <clears throat> if you look at the graph, this thing never hits the x-axis. It'll hit every other value other than um, the x-axis. And it will hit every other value it looks like other than negative one-fourth. And that's because of the hole there. There's no place else that that y value could ever be taken on. So your range, and this is where you actually had to do some of that analysis, basically has to eliminate zero for y and negative one-fourth for y. So the range will go from negative infinity up to negative one-fourth. And then from negative one-fourth up to zero. And then from zero off to infinity. So in this case, we actually had a range that was a little bit more interesting. All right, again, there are so many different versions of how this works. That's a good start. That's a few examples that should help you out. Um, and you know what the criteria are. So that should hopefully be able to get you through section um, 2.4.